Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Good afternoon, listeners. Welcome to the sixth episode of the Ad Nauseam podcast, coming at you live from our studios, the Vomitorium in Grand Rapids, Michigan. My name is David Noe. As always, I have with me here my wonderful co-host, Jeff Winkle. How are you, Jeff? I'm doing great. Always good to be here. Excellent. So we want to give a couple of shout outs today before we get into it. We want to say hello to Matt and Lauren Brownfield, who are in Austin, Texas. So Lauren and Matt were my students a long, long time ago, and uh, Lauren's sister sold me pecans. Sold you pecans? That's right. It was it was nuts. (laughs) (laughs) Were these were were they uh, digital students of yours in person? No, no, these were real flesh and blood, real actual students. Yep, as real as the pecans. Excellent. (laughs) It was difficult to get these students to come out of their shell, but eventually. (laughs) How long is this going to go on? (laughs) So I also want to say hello to Bobby Locklear. Uh, who is in North Carolina in a wonderful little town called Tobaccoville. Tobaccoville, North Carolina. Yeah, so yes. hello, Bobby. Hope you're doing well. I wonder if a relation to Heather, perhaps? I doubt it. You doubt it, it's, yeah. it's, Anything's possible in this modern world. That's right, that's right. We also have a little Latin quote for you today. This is, again, taken from the uh, Lewis and Short Dictionary, and it is, Now say osis. Now say osis. That's a, in all my years of Latin, I don't think I've ever encountered that Adjective. That particular adjective, yeah. nauseosis, that which produces nausea. Apparently, it is from Pliny the Elder, or as Dennis Miller would say, Pliny, Pliny. the Elder, right? <laughs> the uh, erotic nauseosis, a vegetable that causes vomiting. Wow. Which is pretty much all of them. Wow. Is it Pl- Pliny the Elder? Pliny yes, the right, Elder. Right, the, the, the polymath. That's right. Right, right, yeah. Yep, the erotic nauseosis. So, what do we have on tap today, Jeff? Um,. Uh, today we are talking about uh, the magnificent and maddening persona of Heinrich, don't call me Heine, Schliemann. Schliemann, Schliemann all right. Yeah. Who we, who we referenced uh, a bit last time because mm-hmm. he is central to the story of the, kind of the archaeological uh, discovery of Troy and uh, lots of the, the, kind of the game-changing discoveries that um, have changed the way we kind of understand myth and its relationship to history. So we're going to talk today about Schliemann, a yes. little bit of his biography, yes. his uh, discoveries, yes. and really whether or not we can trust the man. Is that right? Exactly right. And, uh, um, and just the and these kind of crazy um, pieces from his personal life along the way. Right. Yeah. And then next week, what are we looking at? Uh, next week, I think we're going to cover uh, the movie Troy. The 2004, 2004 right? film Troy. Right. Was that Wolfgang Peterson? Was he the director? Yes. I was trying to think. I, was, I kept thinking... Uh, Werner Herzog, but he would never do a movie like that. So I don't know. It's Wolfgang Peterson. I think so, right. Yeah. right. Uh, uh, with, starring uh, Brad Pitt yeah. as uh, Achilles. Saffron Burroughs, Andromache. Yes. Uh, Sean Bean plays the mean Odysseus, yes, if I'm does. not mistaken. That's right. So next week, a, a full episode on that that movie. Now, are you gonna are you gonna watch it again? In I'll have to. Gonna, yep. I'm gonna to? have to watch it yeah. again. Yeah, me too. All right. So. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It'll be kind of a great way to kind of cap off our, our current series on Homer and then move on to something else. Yeah, maybe something from the Roman era. Yes. Maybe some more Greek poetry. Who knows Let's where the road will take us. We've thousands of years to choose There's from. There's so much. Yep. So let's get right into it, Jeff. And you, you get us started here today, if you will, please. Yeah. Schliemann's early life and career. What are we looking at? Um, so Heinrich Schliemann, he was, um, he was a German gentleman, uh, born in 1822, uh, to a, a lower class family, had a, a father who was a pastor, not a very uh, successful pastor. No, not a very um, pleasant individual no. based on the, what I've read in the Trail biography. So we're dealing here with the work of David Trail, is that yes, right? Yes, David Trail. Yeah, we should acknowledge our kind of our principal source. That's right. And unlike the Iliad, Trail's name does have two L's. It does have two L's, exactly right. Yes, remember that. Kids. There's a trailing L at the end of it, you might say. Exactly right. So, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, he wrote a um, really a wonderful book called Schliemann of Troy. Hmm. Uh, he was, Clever title. I, would, I, I meant to look at this. I, I would guess that he's probably emeritus by now, but he taught for years at uh, University of California, Davis. Mm-hmm. And met him on one occasion, a really, really nice guy. He laughed at all my jokes, which is my measure of a... Of a, of a successful human being. That's really the touchstone of a good man, isn't <laughs> That's it? That's exactly right. So, but, so we're, we'll be referring to and quoting from um, a number of uh, selections from that book today. So in that book, he describes Schliemann's early life, yes. describes his father, his mother. And uh, Schliemann's father apparently was a bit of a philanderer. And philanderer, right, exactly. A failure as a pastor. Failure as a pastor. <laughs> his, mo- his mother died young. 
Um, and Heinrich himself, um, yeah, seems to have had a, a kind of an embattled youth. But um, one of the things that he, he does talk about is how his his father did instill in him kind of a love of of ancient history. So his his father instilled in him this this love of ancient history. And um, Schliemann, in his own diaries and writings, credited his father with kind of setting him down that path. Now, as we'll see with Schliemann, it's it's hard to tell. Um, in many cases, when to trust him. Right. He's a, he is a myth maker. He's constantly, as, as uh, my reading of the trail biography, and I just started last week at your recommendation, he's constantly trying to revise the story of his childhood a little bit. And yes. he, he talks about some of the strange archaeological opportunities in his boyhood neighborhood. <laughs> that's right. That's right. A place called uh, Ankershagen. Yes. Uh, some kind of uh, Norse, maybe, or other kinds of mythical things that were hidden in his neighborhood. Right. Trying to show us that even as a child, he was archaeologically oriented. Exactly right. It, it kind of it, it reminds me in, in some ways of um, uh, like Joseph Smith, mm -hmm. you know, finding kind of these seer stones and um, and the golden plates right. in New York, right, in his backyard, right, right. Similar interests. Yes. So he's um, he has this well in the way he paints his biography that he had this this deep love of ancient history and archaeology and particularly Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, from a very early t uh, point in his life, and. Um, he makes this claim, although it only really comes out later, that uh, he had decided that he was going to find and excavate Troy, Troy at something like age seven, hmm. and that he, his father had shown him this engraving hmm. of, the, of the famous scene of, of Aeneas, the Trojan warrior, escaping from Troy with his, his crippled father on his back and his father carrying the household gods, right. um, this image that was so central to kind of Roman identity. And he saw that, and he was so fascinated by that that he says, I'm going to find that. And what were some of the first steps? Can you tell us a little bit about Schliemann's education? He seems to have been a, a rather unremarkable student. Okay. Right? And, and but it's it's hard to it's hard to kind of separate again kind of the wheat from the chaff in right. in this uh, in, the, in this business. Um, in your reading of Trail, did you come across kind of at things from that struck you about his early education? Well, he says that he went off to the uh, probably going to butcher the German here. So all you native German listeners, plug your ears. The Realschule and the Gymnasium, uh, which was a standard. Uh, path or trajectory for a lower middle class German boy in the 1820s, 1830s, and he began studying Latin. And uh, some of the upper levels of academia, I think, were closed off to him. Right, exactly. So that's, I mean, that seems to be a part, and a part of kind of Schliemann's quote-unquote tragedy. And mm -hmm. he, he played this up in his own writings, is that this unfairness, right. uh, this injustice that, you know, what he really should have been would, would have been, you know, a university professor. That's right. right. I'm just a poor boy. Nobody loves me. Exactly right. And in terms of the way that his family treated him, that seems to be accurate. Yeah. But for whatever reason, he never divulged a lot of those details. Too embarrassing, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. But instead talked about his humble beginnings. Right. Uh, one interesting note from the trail biography is that uh, Schliemann wrote a thoroughly wretched Latin essay. <laughs> That's something we've all done, right? <laughs> right, right, right? But this was at the age of uh, around 11 years old. Okay, yeah. And brought it home to his father. It wasn't good. But that, that seemed to me the, the one really believable element of his uh, supposed childhood obsession with classical culture. Right. That he did actually try his hand at Latin at an early age with no signs of the great philologist he was uh, going to become, polyglot, polyglot later right. on. Yeah, we'll talk about kind of his facility of, with language, uh, which did, it seems to be legit and, and not kind of part of his own you know, kind of narcissistic self-promotion. So, Jeff, do you have a kind of a lead-in quote for us this week that will help us as we move along here in the episode? I do. I have a quote here from the Trail um, biography. And it's a quote that I think in some ways um, says a lot about kind of who Schliemann was and how he, how he saw himself. And so this is a, actually a, a quote from Schliemann's own diary during his, um, his exploration of Ithaca and his attempt to, to nail down the historicity of, of Odysseus' connection with that. He writes, At the northern part of the castle, two walls of large stones run down, which end in a kind of tower. For a long time I sat in the ruins of the palace reading the divine Odyssey, and in particular the recognition scene of Odysseus and Penelope and wept profusely. There is a superb view from the summit. To the west is Kephalenia, to the north the mountain Agoge with the island Asternus in the strait, and Leucadia in the distance. To the east is Arcanania with the island Iatoko in the harbor of Forkis. Besides, nowhere in the world is the sea so clear and the mountains so beautiful as in Greece. Hmm, that's really lovely. It is quite lovely, right. So Schliemann's a good author. He writes in an evocative, uh, sentimental almost, style right. where he's reaching back into the Odyssey and the things that he loved and trying to locate him with himself within this heroic world. Exactly right. And he has this 
it's, I think you see a bit of that kind of deep romanticism mm-hmm. uh, view of those of those things. I mean, to Schliemann, it seems that these characters and these stories were more real in in some sense than the than the living people around him. Right. And so, I mean, not to, you know, to speculate too much, but you know, a, a childhood of deprivation mm-hmm. you know, to retreat into to a kind of romantic fantasy world seems yep. seems very believable. It doesn't seem like an uncommon trajectory. Yeah, exactly. So that was written. Uh, Schliemann wrote those words, I think, in the early to mid 1860s. Yes. But from his childhood to that time, what kind of a life did he go through? How did he make his fortune or fortunes? Right. So with the kind of those upper levels though of uh, of class, you know, lawyer, doctor, professor being really just not available to him, he went into business, which it, again in kind of the class stratified way that Germany uh, was back in the 19th century was kind of second class. If you want a job, you don't have to dirty your hands right. in making in making cash. Gentlemen of leisure don't do such things. Exactly right. But so he goes into business, and, and I mean, there's there's so much that we have to skip over here. But ultimately, finds that he's very good at it. He goes goes and he gets a job with an import export firm. He learns accounting. Accounting. Right. Uh, the grocery kind of uh, list keeping starts out as a grocery clerk. That's right. Like Right. Ulysses Grant, actually. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Grocery store owner in Illinois. Right. Uh, becomes an importer exporter, you yes. said. Like Art Vandelay. Importing and exporting? It, well, it's more the importing than the exporting, but it goes back and forth. Latex products, Latex, primarily. Exactly right. <laughs> and so, this, this required a lot of travel lot on of his travel. part. So he's going all over the place, buying goods, selling goods, as we'll, we'll see, kind of attempting and often successful in cornering the market. Specifically, St. Petersburg, if memory serves. Yes. Russia, yeah. right? Russia, right. And it, it seems that it's during this time of his travel. I mean, his travels took him all over the world. Right. He spent a lot of time in America. America mm-hmm. and all over Europe, Russia, Africa, and it's during this time that he discovers that he's he's really good with languages, right? And he can absorb them, and it doesn't take him long at all to right. to really get the gist and become. But when he got to St. Petersburg, he worked for some firm. I don't remember the name, but he quickly learned Russian, right? And then he began uh, trading in the Netherlands, and then he quickly learned Dutch. And so he kind of bluffed his way at first, but soon once he had learned these languages, he became indispensable to the many firms uh, for which he worked. This exactly. was in, in the days before Google Translate. Exactly right. Right. You, you have to imagine this was uh, 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 a way for him to kind of leapfrog over so many competitors if he could go directly to the source and use right. that language. Now, you know, for those of you who might be have maybe heard a little bit about Schliemann before, it would be very easy to say, well, couldn't that just be another one of his bluffs that he claimed this, you know, years later? But we know from Schliemann kept these copious diaries, um, which are still out there, very readily available. And he made a practice of, of keeping those diaries in the language of whatever country he was working in at the time. And so there are there's this physical, tangible evidence of his of his uh, of his skill. One really remarkable example of that that Trail records is that when he went to Egypt, he learned Arabic, and he wrote 65 pages of his diary. In Arabic, yeah. continuous. Can you imagine? That's, it's, that's, it's it's phenomenal. It reminds me somewhat of the the character Frank uh, Abagnale in the um, Catch Me If You Can movie with Leonardo oh, DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So remember, he goes through all these uh, scams and schemes, but then he passes the Louisiana bar, right? That's right. And that's then right. when he's interviewed by the FBI, I think, and they say, you know, you've been lying that you are a heart surgeon. You've been lying that you're an airline pilot. How did you pass the bar? And he said, I studied. Yeah, yeah. So kind of like Schliemann, some parts of his life are questionable, but this area, he just had a, a philological genius. Exactly right. It comes down to almost like the clever thief. Trope. Right. You know, he must, I mean, Schliemann at some level must have identified with Odysseus on a very uh, kind of one-to-one level. Absolutely. Right? Right. So, I mean, I think there's, there's no doubt that Schliemann was a genius, right? Whatever, you know, whatever kind of the, the gaps in his character and, and um, his fudging things around the edges, uh, the man, he was a, a force to be reckoned with. So tell us, what are some of the languages in which he was fluent? Right. So um, kind of the official list, as, as, as I found it, he was, um, he was conversant, if not fluent, in by the end of his life in English, French, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Russian, Swedish, Polish, Greek, both ancient and modern, Latin, Arabic, and of course, his native German. Klingon? Klingon. Yeah. I mean, if he had lived long enough, you know he would have been... There's no doubt. People on the interwebs with his Klingon quotes, right? <laughs> Worst made-up language ever. Yeah. <laughs> so he makes a fortune yes. in Russia, cornering the market on all of these goods. Yes. He's a military contractor. Right. So he's, he takes advantage of all of these conflicts going on right. in the region, uh, the Crimean War. Right. Um, in so, some evidence points, he's selling he's selling weapons to both sides. Right. right? <laughs> Clever move. Clever move. So the Crimean War, Russia, Britain engaged in a conflict over this island, Crimea in the Black Sea. Yes. 
actually Greek territory at one time. True. Yeah, in yep. the uh, eighth, seventh centuries, the Greeks are colonizing all around the Black Sea. Yes, exactly right. So he makes a he makes a ton of money. He makes he makes money uh, over in this country in in America. Wait a minute, uh, Schliemann was in the U.S. He was. He spent time in San Francisco. He spent time in Indiana, or at least faked being in in, in Indiana. I don't know why he'd fake being in Indiana. Well, he faked, I think, a five year residence. That's right to get a I'm, divorce. Right? That's right to that's get right. a divorce. We'll get to that. Right? We'll get that. That's a really fascinating point. But he comes to. San Francisco in um, 1851, and his brother was there, right? Right. And the trail book points out that his brother, um, he said that his brother didn't know he was coming, but there's actual correspondence of them before Schliemann's arrival. That's right. This strange redaction of the historical record that he engages in. It is. It's really strange. He kind of almost he's he's almost forced Gumpian. Yeah. And like he he's always showing up at like at the perfect time. Millard Fillmore. Millard, oh man, he was the, he he, uh, he he claimed to like have like an hour and a half meeting with Millard Fillmore. Yeah. Fillmore, he put off a meeting that he was supposed to go to. He said, I got to talk with this guy. I got to talk with Schliemann. Right. And which, which I think Trail suggests likely never happened. Right. Yeah. So concerned about cultivating his public image yeah. in a time when very few people thought of that, apparently. Yes, exactly. So uh, way ahead of his time mm -hmm. in a not, not a very good way, I suppose. Arrives in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, the gold rush. The gold rush, right. So just a couple of years after, you know, the, the 49ers. Right. right. And it makes makes more money there. In six months, how much money did he make? He was uh, over a million dollars. Wow. Right. So he, I don't have my calculator. But no, that, but in 2020 terms. It's got to be. You could buy a small country for exactly that. Exactly right. Yeah, his own private island. Right. right? Uh, incredible. So by the time, I think Trail says, by the time he's about 35, 36, he's got more money than he could ever spend in a number of lifetimes. And he's independently wealthy. And this is when he turns his attention towards what he's most famous for. There's these archaeological uh, expeditions and uh, most famously kind of his discoveries at Troy and then later at, at Mycenae. Um, so it's, it's important. I think it's important to kind of to um, to emphasize is that Schliemann did not have any formal training right. in, in archaeology. That kind of that world of, of the university world was it was closed to him. Um, no and, formal education, no, no formal really, education. beyond a high school level. Right, right. Um, but a polymath. I mean, from his own diaries and from his own writings, it's clear that he read everything that he could on the subject. Right. So he I, he wasn't just going out there with a, a pickaxe and just hacking at things. As I think as he sometimes depicted. I mean, he was probably more learned in, in many ways than than lots of trained archaeologists, but he did not have a formal degree for that profession. So that reminds me, Jeff, of a point that uh, the authors uh, Heath and Hansen make in their uh, work, Who Killed Homer? Yeah. Mid-late 90s. They make the claim that many very significant advances in the study of classics were made by amateurs. Right, right. So um, give me another example. Of well, Schliemann is a main example. Yes. And you have uh, Michael Ventris, who deciphered Linear B in the right. 1950s. Very, Which would be another great topic. Perhaps. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, David Packard from the Packard Bell, uh, who was a, a BA in classics, I think, but gave a lot of money to the digitization of classics and was really a pioneer in that field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Schliemann, he... He obviously, I think, as a, I think a, a phrase that I used in our last episode, he, I think he kicked open doors that needed to be kicked open. He just might have kicked them open maybe a little bit too forcefully, right? In some, in some degree. So, right. So there's still this debate about you know what was Schliemann? Was he uh, just a amateur archaeologist? Was he a grave robber? Was he a treasure hunter? Was he uh, um, at best a skilled amateur? Um, I, I don't make any claim to kind of answer those questions. Right. But it's it's all part of kind of his maddening persona. So we're going to touch on one more biographical element. Yes. Is that right? The question of his marriage and divorce, marriages? Yes. Because this is really fascinating. And then turn to the events at Troy and Mycenae. I'd like to just mention briefly kind of his um, his, his first attempts on Ithaca. Because there's okay. just some great stories. There. Right. Right, right. So, but yeah, let's let's talk about his personal life. Okay, so he, he married a woman named Katerina, uh, a Russian woman. And she was from a, a higher class family than Schliemann himself was, right. a woman from St. Petersburg. And apparently they had an absolutely miserable marriage. She didn't want to live anywhere but Russia. Meanwhile, he had, if I'm not mistaken, he had all kinds of ambitions to live in Paris, to live in London. Of course, he spoke French and English fluently. Right. He bought up a lot of uh, property near Saint-Michel in Paris, and he wanted Katerina to live there right. and their children. I get kind of the vibe that... Ew, he kind of had like, I'll show you. Right. Right. So he was, he wanted to overcome his, 
his low class beginning so yeah. much that he was going to vault over everybody right. and prove that he belonged in that echelon of society. Right? Which he certainly succeeded in doing from a financial standpoint. Absolutely, right. He was, had fabulous wealth. So that marriage was on the rocks. Yes. Uh, he had a daughter, Natalia, I believe, yes. uh, who died when she was 11 or 12 is the yeah. age I'm thinking. And his travels took him away from his family for months at a time. Right. That, that certainly could not have helped either. Right. And in these diaries, he wrote letters. Yes. About these events, right? Right, exactly. Um, but uh, it, it comes down to the marriage falls apart. Right. And um, So he, where does he go to secure a... Uh, Consequence-free divorce. Well, where everybody goes, Indianapolis. Indianapolis, right? or at least yes, he, these, these, he establishes some kind of residency, or or fakes it enough to make it appear that he's living in Indianapolis. This is Indianapolis, Indiana, yes, approximately exactly. five or six hours south of here. That's exactly right. Which apparently was, maybe still is, known for its very lax divorce laws. Right. right? So he comes to the United States. He gets a passport. Yep. Some things happen in New York. He hires the best lawyers. He has yep. plenty of money. Stops in at the Fillmore's. Yes. And uh, and what happens next? He finally gets his his, his divorce, and, and now he's free to uh, kind of pursue his passion unfettered, as it were. But that's not the end of his of his married life, though. One fascinating note in the trail biography that stuck out to me was that he was really hoping that the Indiana legislature would not vote on changing their divorce laws. <laughs> right. And they were prevented from doing it because they didn't want to vote on a civil rights law. Oh, this wow. was post-Civil War. Yeah. So they, I think in Schliemann's words, they didn't want to grant the vote to Negroes, so they delayed convening and then actually worked in Schliemann's favor. So they didn't change the divorce law, and then he was able to... Incredible. To get his divorce from this Russian woman. Strange world. Already an international world. Yes. Bizarre. Very, very bizarre. So um, Schliemann, ultimately, he moves to Athens. Always felt where he, he belonged, right? It uh, becomes a base for him for kind of launching his Greece-based archaeology. And he decides that he, he, wants a, he wants a wife. Right. And so he's, the story goes is that he was um, being tutored in Greek by a local archbishop. And he asked this guy to help him out. He acts as kind of a matchmaker. He, um, and the Archbishop, okay, what are you looking for? And Schliemann uh, famously, apparently responds that he's looking for a black-haired Greek woman in the Homeric spirit. That's a quote, isn't it? That is a quote. Find me a black-haired Greek woman in the Homeric spirit. In the Homeric spirit. spirit, right. I'm not exactly sure what that means. But, I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, that's, I mean, that's how you wooed uh, Tara, your own wife, right? Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> and, she definitely has a Greek spirit. You recognize kind of the Homeric spirit about her? Absolutely. Yeah, that's right, right. Yeah, during one memorable time, we were reading the Aeneid together. And it spoke to her. Yeah. You're, at telling least, the, you're telling the truth right now. I am. Yeah. At least while we were dating, it spoke to her. <laughs> yeah, because uh, if Mrs. Noe is listening, and she's probably not, true story. The Greek spirit, right? The Homeric woman is proud, yes. fiercely independent, yes. beautiful, uh, walks into a room and confronts the men, yes. as Penelope does on many occasions. Right. She, she, when she first appears in the Odyssey, the suitors stumble all over themselves. That's right. That's right. Because she's gorgeous and she's in charge. Right. So that's the kind of woman that Schliemann supposedly is looking for. He's looking for. And I think you could make a case that he does at some level find this woman in, in, in Sophia. Well, I was a little unsure about that. Wait, it's unclear exactly. A lot about their relationship. Because it's all filtered through his diary. Right, right. It's hard to know. And Gastromenu is her, uh, her name, Which right? It's a perfect name for this podcast. It's yeah. something like in, the, in the stomach, right? In the stomach. And Gastromenu. And in fact, in the Gospels, if, you're, if anyone's curious, uh, the description of um, Mary's conception, and Gastri, right? Yeah. That she had a uh, Christ, and Gastri. Interesting. In the womb. is a euphemism for in the womb. Yeah. Right? Rather than giving a strictly biological description. Yeah. Yeah. So Sophie and Gastromenu. Yeah. So the story goes, so the, the archbishop goes out and he gets, he comes back with three photographs and says, here are three eligible bachelorettes. What do you think, Heine? Homeric enough. Homeric enough. Black haired enough. And he, uh, he points, he says that one. And he points to the picture of, of Sophia in Gastromenu. Without going into all the details of their courtship, they ultimately do get married in 1869. Heinrich is 47 years old. And Sophia is a fresh-faced 17. Yeah, it's incredible. Right. And apparently he made uh, lavish promises to her parents about how he would set them up financially. That's right. That's and right. so for the early years of their marriage, there was some controversy because Schliemann was reluctant to keep those promises. Right. Or they were grasping. It's not really clear. We don't have a lot of information from her family. Right. But some kind of conflict ensued there. Also, he was really keen on making her a student of archaeology. Yes. And making her a polyglot. Right. And uh, the biographies say this is kind of an aspect of his controlling character. Yes. 
But I wonder if it's also somewhat just like a 19th century novel, right? If you've read Dickens or those kinds of things, the accomplished, wealthy, older man takes the young woman under his wing and turns her into an Eliza Doolittle kind of character. Yeah, 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 exactly, right. So I'm all part of kind of this larger kind of romantic right. picture that he's painting of himself. Right? Strange and disturbing at, on some levels, but also just hard to figure out. Right. And he seemed to be so kind of desperate at many turns to you know have Sophia kind of show up in his story as kind of his right hand woman. Right. As someone who's just just as obsessed about these things as he was. And falsified her presence yes. at various sites. Famously at, at Troy. Yeah, she wasn't there during the time of the most important discoveries. Right. Right, as right. he admits in his own diary. Um well let's turn to some of these these excavations. So before we get to kind of the, his uh, most famous discoveries at Troy and Mycenae, uh, I wanted just to briefly talk about some of his early explorations and he famously goes to Ithaca, the island of Ithaca, uh, where Odysseus and Penelope are from and his grand hopes were to find the palace and, and find artifacts uh, associated with Odysseus and Penelope. He claimed to fo- have found pottery, and he speculated that it would belong to Odysseus and Penelope. Right. So again, that, that very literal, yeah. very literal uh, take on Homer. So Ithaca is uh, west of the Peloponnese, off yes. the coast, yes. somewhere between Greece and Italy in the Adriatic? Yes, exactly right. What's the quote you have for us? It's one of the more famous stories about Schliemann, and it just speaks to kind of not just how obsessed he was with these stories, but really how he saw himself becoming a character. He saw himself kind of almost morphing into Odysseus. Here again from uh, the trail book, but quoting from Schliemann's own diaries and talking about his explorations on Ithaca. He, uh, Schliemann writes, On that day... Wishing to approach the farmyard of a peasant at the south end of the island, I was furiously attacked by four large dogs that were not frightened by the stones or threats I hurled at them. I cried out for help, but my guide had remained behind, and it seems that there was nobody in the peasant's house. In this terrible predicament, I fortunately recalled what Ulysses, Odysseus, had done in a similar danger. And here he's he's quoting from and referring to a a passage from Book 14 of the Odyssey. Suddenly the barking dogs saw Odysseus and ran up to him howling, But Odysseus prudently sat down, and his stick fell from his hand. So I followed the example of the wise king, bravely sitting down on the ground, remaining immobile. And at once the four dogs, who seemed ready to devour me, formed a circle around me and continued barking, but did not touch me. Hmm. So he becomes Odysseus in that moment. And uh, the the Odyssey becomes a handbook for how to deal with wild, crazy dogs. I was just going to say that. It's a very uh, ancient way of looking at Homer. Yes. It's not just a story. It's a DIY book. For all of life. Right, right. That, that, that's a good point. It's, uh, in many ways, Schliemann's use of, the, of Homer is much more Fully ancient. Greek, absolutely. Yes, very Greek. The 5th century uh, audience would have understood exactly what Schliemann is talking about. Right, exactly. You're going to go on YouTube and try to find out how to deal with a pack of dogs. No, you're going to remember Odyssey Book 14. This right. is what you do. You sit down. Yeah, and it works like an absolute charm. Right. we got to talk about the, the Nausicaa. We do. Okay. Nausicaa, the, the young woman that Odysseus encounters in the Odyssey. Right. And there's another uh, great scene kind of in this same vein where Schliemann, like it's still on, on Ithaca. Um, you say Nausicaa, I say Nausicaa. Nausicaa. Let's call the whole thing off. Yeah, exactly. We'll agree to, to All disagree. Right. Um, so he, again, Schliemann writes in his diary, Despite this, I wanted to see the spot where Nausicaa played uh, ball with her companions and met Odysseus. And since I could not jump across the channels, I took off my clothes. Uh-oh. Um, nope. Look out. <laughs> Keeping only my shirt and woolen undershirt and waited across. So, Did they wear woolen undershirts in the 19th century? So he's, he's just got the shirt and the undershirt on and everything else is okay. al fresco. Keep moving. Okay, sorry. Often I was up to my middle in mud and water. Often I took a wrong turning and had to come back. But finally, my efforts were successful, and I reached the mouth of the ancient river. Joyfully, I imagined there Nausicaa's welcome of Odysseus. My state of undress caused me considerable embarrassment in front of the women, who were busily pulling out the ripe flax from the ground, root and all, and throwing it over their heads to dry. In addition, I had to suffer the taunts of the men who were engaged in taking a ditch. Hmm. So a kind of a rare moment of self-deprecation. Yes, but Schliemann becomes, he's becoming Odysseus. Yes, he's becoming Odysseus. And you know the women with the flax there are kind of like right. uh, you know the Nausicaa's entourage, right. right? And so he's Odysseus washes up naked on the beach. Yes, he's lost everything. That's the that's the message in the Odyssey. Lost yeah. all his companions, everything, not a shred of clothing left. And then he quickly moves on from there to his palace on Ithaca and writes all the wrongs. But... Right, exactly. And so I mean, I think in some ways, kind of sees himself doing the same. That's right. Yeah. So let's move on to Troy. Yes. This is the this is the big prize. Mm-hmm. And um, what Schliemann claims, like we said, that he, he claimed that he wanted to excavate. He wanted to excavate since he was seven years old. Yep. And now he finally has the means 
and the freedom and the money to do this. So this is 1870, fall, yes. fall of 69, uh, spring, summer of 70. He's right. now, what, 48 years old? Yeah. Yeah. Approximately. About that, right? Yep. A year after marrying Sophia. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's out there. Uh, and it's important to note that he's not the only one doing this. No. Right. Who are some of the other important names? Well, the, the most, I think the most important name here is, is Frank Calvert. Right. Who was um, academically more legit. We mentioned him last week. We did. Frank yes. and his family, he had a brother, Frederick. They lived there in Troy, right? Right. Exactly. They lived there in Troy. And Calvert was... Or very, Turkey, we should say, probably. Right. Yeah. Northwestern, mm -hmm. Northwestern Turkey. And he was very instrumental in kind of narrowing down the, um, the possible sites of uh, what could be Troy, right? There were a number of the, what archaeologists call these tells, mm -hmm. kind of unexcavated mounds. I think it's often the story is told that Schliemann is such a maverick that he's the only one doing this. He probably would like to have seen himself that way. Yes. But he was, he was one of a, maybe a handful that were taking these stories more seriously. He just turned out to be the most successful. And the question is, were all of his practices legitimate or right. were they shady? He seems to have been pretty unkind to Calvert and ripped him off on a number of occasions. It, yeah. Um, right. So it's, it's, uh, Calvert, who I, I believe is is the one who ultimately steers Schliemann towards the mound uh, called uh, Hiserlik, yeah. which ends up, long story short, ends up being what we accept now as the, the site of ancient Troy. Earlier it was Buna Shabi. Buna Shabi, right. And there's a t talking about a great story. So Sh Schliemann is, is considering this other mound, Buna mm -hmm. Shabi. And he's like, Do tell. D D oh, D nice. <laughs> <laughs> and so... He's got to test it, right? So he's got how do, how do we figure is this, is it is it Troy E enough? Right. He's got to find a way. And so again to the trail book, um, Schliemann goes and, and checks out Berna Shabi and from his diary. We we read about how he, he comes to the conclusion that this is not the right place. He says, I left my guide with the horse at the top, and I went down the precipice, which inclines at first at an angle of forty five degrees, and then at an angle of almost sixty five degrees, so that I was forced to go down on all fours. It took me almost fifteen minutes to get down. And I came away convinced that no mortal, not even a goat, was ever able to run down a slope of 65 degrees and that Homer, always so precise in his topography, could not have wanted us to believe that Hector and Achilles ran down this impossible slope three times. Yeah, the three-time race around Troy right. couldn't happen here. No, and this comes up again with, with Schliemann again and again. He seems to have this very detailed and imaginative way that these things happen. Well, he has a detailed and extensive knowledge of Homer. Yeah, well, yes, without a doubt. Self-taught. Self-taught. But then he wants to apply all of these details precisely to the terrain. Exactly. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's not clear what's going on. Right. And so in, the, in this case, that uh, again, he kind of stumbles onto the truth, but not for by any kind of really scientific method. Right. He moves on to the, the mound of, of, of Hiserlik, and this is where he starts his most, um, some of his most famous discoveries. He starts to dig and digs several trenches. He's there, I think, ultimately three years, I believe, right? Removes a massive amount of material, right? right? Uh, cubic meters of rubble each day, cuts off the top of Troy, even though Calvert and Calvert's wife, both of whom were, you know, decent scholars, are telling him, you know, don't do that. Don't remove all this material. You're going to ruin the site. Yes. And if you just take off the top, you're not going to find the Troy you're looking for because right. they're they're Byzantine, they're a Roman, they're ruins stacked upon ruins. Right. More than seven levels of Troy. Yes, exactly right. So the archaeology at this point is still a rather new science. But, um, yeah, guys like Calvert recognize that when you're dealing with, with a tell, mm -hmm. you're dealing with all kinds of layers of time, not just some kind of photograph. And you have to note every location and every depth. Right. And for an amateur, I guess Schliemann was pretty accurate but still cut some corners. Right. He had an idea of what he wanted to find, right? He was looking for a, something that was... Priam's treasure. He, he, Priam's treasure. He was, he was looking for a, a, a city that he had imagined, and he wanted to find the city that he imagined. Did he find it? What do you think? Well, I mean, I think he, he set the ball rolling for, for finding you know, the Troy that, as we talked about last time, the levels of Troy that we now accept being from that, the era of the Trojan War mm -hmm. and show evidence of some kind of conflict. Right. Um, but he barrels right through that. Mm -hmm. In fact, his most famous discovery, the so-called Treasure of Priam, he finds at Troy level two. And so, um, you know, it, it couldn't have been right. from Homer's Troy. The chronology is wrong. It is, it's, it's completely wrong. Hundreds of years off. Right. But Schliemann doesn't, he doesn't know these things, doesn't care about these things. And here it's also the fishiness of his, of his discoveries comes into play. Just like, as we'll see at Mycenae, he discovers this cache of treasure. Yep. And it's right at the end of his excavation time. Or he, he finds this, and it's not long after that, he just, he stops the excavation. So he finds this tremendous hoard of 
gold and uh, jewelry and bowls. He shuts down the excavation. At the end, uh, one of the criticisms, criticisms I've read is that people say, if you find that, wouldn't that be just reason to stick around? To keep going. But for him, it's like, boom, it's the... It's the big song and dance number. Well, and so the implication is that he salted these sites right. with things he had counterfeited yes. and brought in. Again, we're talking about an era where there weren't a lot of international laws about like what can go in and out of the country. And Schliemann knew how to skirt them. Sure. And he knew who to, he knew who to pay off. Right. And, um, but, the, I mean, the, the Turks themselves start getting wind of, of what he's doing and what he's finding. And so these um, rumors that he's having forgeries made and passing them off to the Turks and smuggling the real stuff out of the country... Uh, is a shadow that really follows him really to the, for the rest for of the his rest life. Of his life. Yes. And in his own diary, he admits that sometimes to avoid a workman stealing things, you know, whether they would or not, who knows, but this is what Schliemann says. Yeah. He would have uh, his wife hide some of these items in her skirts and so forth. Right. And he would, you know, control the times when the boat left the Troad mm-hmm. to go back to Athens uh, to skirt, you know, the inspections from the Turkish officials. Yeah. It's very much a Wild West kind of environment that he was functioning in right and right. promoting probably yes exactly right so it seems that the, the bulk of that so-called treasure the, uh, ends up winding up in berlin hmm. and uh, on display for many many years right? yeah i want to talk about one object that i wasn't really familiar with until i read the trail book and i've had the good providence to visit many world museums for which i'm you know i'm very grateful yeah and that is the helios metope so the helios metope which was found in troy is a, a picture of helios the sun god uh, on a, a quite a large uh, relief sculpture, which means it's not sculpted in the round, but the figure is just in relief that is protruding slightly from the substrate, from the background, you might say. So it's the god Helios with his sun chariot and the rays coming off his head like a halo. Yeah. And I didn't remember this. I've never seen it. And so then I you know, did a Google search, and apparently it's in Berlin. And um, Schliemann cheated Calvert out of the real value of it by lowballing the value and then paying him for half. So something yeah. by like a, a one-tenth of the actual value. Wow. So Schliemann was a very, very shrewd businessman. Right. That seems very schliemann Yes, it does. You? Right. Come on, Heine. Right. Yeah, let's wrap up this part by yeah. talking about the, the Nachleben and the afterlife of some of these Trojan treasures. Prime's treasure was on display until uh, 1945. If you know a little bit of history, yes. 1945 Berlin, not the not the greatest place to be. No. You got Hitler in his bunker. Not a place you'd want to stroll and pick up a latte. Exactly right. So what happens then in 45 in Berlin? Well, you got you know you got the Americans and the Brits coming from the west and the Russians coming from the east. Russians get there first. Let's call them Soviets. Soviets. Okay. Yes. Um, Racing toward Berlin. Right. And it's chaos, mm. right? I mean, so many kind of you know, treasures and paintings have been lost and destroyed and Right. And Prime's treasure was was one of those things that just disappears. So the Allies show up at the museum in Berlin and they say, hey, where are the treasuries of uh, Priam? Where's the gold? It was the very first question. Right. Right. And the Soviets say, what treasure? And uh, so it was assumed by many that they just suffered the fate of so many many other pieces of art and were destroyed. Fell into a giant hole. Fell into a giant. All the Allied bombing. So what happens next? Well, in 1991, when the Soviet Union uh, collapses, uh, people start asking questions. And lo and behold, Priam's treasure shows up. In, in the basement? Yes, of the, uh, was it the Pushkin Museum? The Pushkin Museum in right. St. Petersburg, right? It reminds me of that last scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, right. winds up in this, this, uh, <laughs> this crate. Right? Yes. Yeah. And so and so now, it, uh, I believe it's still there. And the right? Russians say, oh, where did this come from? Yeah. Hey, what do you know? Look at this. <laughs> and it's become part of the kind of this almost four-way tug of war or, or, uh, you know, between Germany and Turkey and Greece, Greece? And, uh, and Russia. Who, who lays claim to this right. treasure, right? So the Greeks say... These are part of our heritage. Yes. Give them back. The Turks say yes, but they were found in our territory. Right. And the Germans say, but they were gifted to us by Schliemann. Yeah. And the Russians, what do they I say? say? Spoils of war. I don't right. know. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I believe they're still in. I think all of it is still hmm. is still in Russia today. Are we going to take an ad nauseum uh, tour, maybe, to the Pushkin Museum and see this stuff? Oh, that would be fabulous. Let's do that. Right? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Do you, have to, do you have to go in the basement and open the box? I don't know. Right. Yeah. So today's episode is brought to you by uh, the Moss Method. David, tell us a little bit about what that is. Right. So the Moss Method is a way for those who don't need credit for studying Greek. They're not looking for a degree necessarily, but they want to get some skill. It's a way for them to study ancient Greek on their own. People do this? They do this, absolutely. We have a number of people all over the world studying Greek via the Moss Method. 
So Charles Melville Moss put together this textbook, 1893, University of Illinois graduate, and this gives people an accessible, self-paced, and expert way to learn the Greek language. And it works. It works, absolutely. That's fabulous. So you start out in the first lesson reading connected prose. You've got adapted stories from Herodotus, adapted stories from Lucian, from Aesop. You get right into it, and I take you through step-by-step how to gain the knowledge that you need to approach Greek. You might want to read Plato. You might want to read Herodotus or even Homer. This is going to get you there. And how can uh, interested uh, people find this? Well, I'm so glad you asked, Jeff, in such a natural way. (laughs) They can go to mossmethod.com. They can check out the introductory video. They can watch a sample lesson on YouTube. And uh, a lot of people say, how long is this course going to take? And I say, who are you and why are you emailing me? <laughs> no, I say, there's no limit, right? You, you can study as long as you want. It's self-paced. And what's the rush, right? If something is worth doing, it's worth doing slowly. Yes. It's even worth doing poorly. Take your time. Greek is meant to be enjoyed. It's like a good meal. Get into the aesthetics of it. So some people complete the course in three months. Some take as long as 18 months. There's four separate modules. Now, it's not cheap, but I'd like to say it's attainable. Yeah. It's $299 per module, and you get constant interaction with yours truly. Sounds great. Yeah, so I email you back. I grade your assignments. I talk to you. I help you. You've got uh, 40 different video lessons per module that you access once you sign up. Sounds fabulous. Mossmethod.com. Mossmethod.com. That's right. Now, I also hear that Latin per diem is undergoing a redesign. Yes, we have a massive redesign Tell us about of it. the Latin per diem website. We're digging down into the shaft graves, you Ooh, might yes. say, and bringing up all kinds of treasures. Yeah. So Latin per diem started about five years ago, uh, has all of these resources for learning Latin. You can watch a four-minute lesson per day based on real-life authors. So everything from Cicero to St. Augustine to John Calvin to Erasmus, the whole gamut. We run the gamut. You're always mixing it up. Mixing it up. Yeah. Each series is about 10 different episodes, and we go on to the next one. And for those who want to check it out, they can also check out these quizzes. So you watch the four-minute episode, and then you follow the link. You take a quick quiz which tests you on your knowledge. What have you learned? What have you gained? If you do this consistently over a long period of time, you're going to learn a massive amount of Latin. That's fabulous. Which everyone would want to do. And uh, can they find this at latinperdm.com? Latinperdm.com. Sounds fabulous. So Jeff, what about uh, the Ad Nauseam podcast? What kind of success have we had so far? It's uh, it's been great so far. With a little over a month, uh, we've got right around a thousand downloads. Over a thousand downloads in a month. Yes, it's it's great. That's fantastic. We're getting um, a a lot more than I thought we would get. So there seems to be some momentum behind it, and so I'm really excited about where this is going. I'm really gratified. Yeah, same here. Not so much amazed because that's (laughs) self-congratulatory. I'm grateful. I'm I'm so thankful that people are downloading it. They're listening to it. I got a comment just the other day from a friend in Arizona. And I said, uh, how is your son liking ad nauseum? And he said something like, he feels like it's giving him an in-depth understanding of the Iliad, and he can't stop laughing. Wow, that's, that's high praise. That is yeah. exactly what we want. Exactly. Kind of so thing. how can listeners support our efforts? What should they do? It's just by leaving reviews. That's right. Um, on At uh, Apple, Spotify. Whatever your platform is, yep. right? If you like it, uh, tell us you like it. Yeah. We'd be so grateful for that. And we'd love to hear suggestions for episode uh, themes. That's right. Yeah. So topics at ad nauseum.com. Yes. Uh, you can also contact us individually. You know, if you want to complain about me, you send an email to Jeff. <laughs> At ad nauseum.com. Right. And if you want to complain about uh, me, where Which nobody would want to complain about you, Jeff. Of course not. Right. Exactly. You would uh, send your missive to Dave at ad nauseum. Thanks, everyone, for listening. <laughs> so we move on from Troy to Mycenae. To Mycenae. So, there, I mean, there's um, also, um, it seems that Schliemann used some of Priam's treasure or uh, as, as a kind of leverage, I, I, undoubtedly playing uh, off kind of the animosity between. Turks and Greeks. Yes, and Uh, between professional archaeologists. Yes. Because he really wanted to go to Mycenae. Right. And he staked a claim to Olympia. So let's turn to what happened at Mycenae. So um, you want to you want to talk a little bit about what 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 did he do? What did he find there? And um, why is it so important? Yeah. So Mycenae is on the Peloponnese, which is west of Athens across the Saronic Gulf. And Mycenae gave its name to the Mycenaean civilization, as it turns out. The legendary home of Agamemnon, yes. the guy who led the expedition to Troy, husband of Clytemnestra, who murdered him eventually yep. upon his return. So those of you who have read some Aeschylus 
one of his most famous uh, tragedies is Agamemnon, yeah. which is about the murder. In the opening scene, Agamemnon comes home, and uh, the guard is lying dogwise on the roof. Just dogwise. A wonderful Greek expression. Yes, right. So he comes home to Mycenae, and he's uh, promptly murdered yeah. by his wife Clytemnestra and his cousin Aegisthus. That's right. Who are having an affair. He brings home Cassandra. This is obviously for another episode because it's just a wonderful tragedy. But antiquity had recorded all of these events. And then Pausanias, the Greek travel guide, right? This is, uh, what's the century? Second century. Second century AD. AD. Pausanias yeah. goes on the world tour, much like Schliemann. Yes. And records what he sees at all of these sites. And when he comes to Mycenae, he says, you can find here, you can see here the graves of Agamemnon, the grave of Clytemnestra and Aegisthus, because, of course, they were then killed by Agamemnon's son, Orestes. That's right. You can find the graves of Eurymedon, of all of these famous kings, as well as uh, Agamemnon's father, Atreus. Right. So Schliemann goes there, and he starts to dig. Yeah. I, I mean, amongst the, some of the uh, famous things he finds there, he finds these, uh, uh, these Tholoi uh, tombs. What's a Tholos tomb? It, it's, a, it's a massive... Uh, sometimes they're called beehive tombs. These um, partially, well, they're kind of covered in a hill, but they're, they're these massive, almost Egyptian-like stone structures that cone shaped, cone shaped, right? right? They kind of come up to a point, like a, like a beehive. Yeah, you'd walk into it, and you'd be on the inside of the beehive, right? And the surface is nicely smoothed out, yeah. right? There's a giant entryway, a huge causeway that That's leads right. you to the, the the doors of the tomb. Yeah, a yeah. dromos. So the architecture is described as. As uh, Cyclopean. Right. Yes. Because only a Cyclops would be strong enough to move these massive stones into place. Exactly right. Right. And another, that term also applied to kind of the walls of Mycenae as they're found as well. It, That's right. It's, it's still, um, it boggles the mind. Yep. Tyrans, other Mycenaean yes. sites. How do they do this? So the Cyclopean architecture becomes one of the hallmarks of Mycenaean civilization. Exactly right. So he starts to dig there, and he, he, grave circles. He, he, yeah, so he immediately, of course, he, he makes these claims um, saying, yeah, Pausanias was right. What he saw, I found, right? I found the grave of, of so-and-so and, and so-and-so, and the list goes on. Um, but his most famous, in some ways his most controversial finds, are the, um, the stuff he finds like right inside the, the gate, just beyond the famous Lion Gate of Mycenae. Uh, today, if you visit the site, you walk through the Lion Gate and you turn immediately right, and there are these grave circles that Schliemann dug up. Grave circle A, grave circle B. That's right. And these are shaft graves. Yes. What's a shaft grave? It's these kind of these long, narrow shafts dug down deep into the into the soil. Imagine taking a Pringles can. Yes, exactly. Right, inserting it into the... No one would ever do this because they're Pringles, but <laughs> inserting it into the soil. Yes. Right, removing all the Pringles right. and then layering into that cylinder bodies... Jewelry, Jewelry ornamental gems. weapons. Yes, that's a shaft grave. That's a shaft grave. And so he finds a number of these. He, he, he finds five of these, hmm. ultimately. And what are in these shaft graves? He's pulling out one gold piece after another. All these gold buttons, these ornamental weapons. Diadems. Diadems. Um, and, in, of course, you know, Schliemann immediately gets proof of Homer. Um, you know, the, the nickname of, of Mycenae that pops up is Mycenae Rich in Gold. But by far the most famous things that he finds in these shaft graves are these death masks. Uh, and he pulls out a number. I, I think, is it, does he find five? Five or six, yep. Yep. And um, which apparently at one point had covered the faces of the dead in these shaft graves. Here's where it kind of, the most famous controversy kicks in, is he finds a number of these, and um, they, they're they not attractive. Right. At least the first four or five that he finds. I there. think Trails says about one of them that the face fits no one's imagination of what a king would look like. <laughs> exactly right, right, right. Um, so your basic ad nauseum host and co-host. <laughs> exactly. In class, I compare them to like puffer fish. Right. Like they're kind of bloated, round. and Three-dimensional, really. Three-dimensional. They're kind of, I mean, there's a, there's a depth to these masks. Yeah, these masks are also considerably thicker and heavier than the one that is supposedly the mask of Agamemnon. Right. Right. Um, um, big goofy ears, right? And but flesh underneath. Yes. And when the masks are taken off, according to the story, so he brings in from Athens an artist to draw the face, and then he sends a telegram off to King George, the king of Greece. Yes. Who's not a Greek, actually. No, he's a, he's a, he's a Danish guy. Who has been installed on the throne there. Right. And the telegram says something along the lines of, I have gazed into the face of Agamemnon. Right. That's kind of the romantic myth that survives around this. Um, we have the actual telegram. It doesn't have kind of that gauzy wording, but he, he, he does telegram the king and says, um, I have found the graves of Agamemnon and, and all of these other you know, you know, mythical um, elites. 
and makes these again these very bold claims. The the original of that telegram, or you know, an early copy at least, is in the Mycenaean room in the museum there, That's just right, right a few the, feet away right from front. yeah, right. a few feet away from the mask of Agamemnon. Right. So Jeff, is this really Agamemnon? What are the arguments for and against? Well, the. Uh, Trail is, um, he kind of comes down on the side. Well, I think at the end of the day, I think Trail is on record saying that he doesn't really know. But he's, along with William Calder, who was at University of Illinois for years, are two of the guys who kind of stirred the pot. So again, it, the, the, there's lots of reasons to be suspicious. Um, one, the mask does not, it's, it's kind of, it, it's in the same family of those other masks, but it's much more um, proportional. So things like the eyelids, eyelids, right? the, the lack of eyelashes as the other masks have yes the imperial which apparently is a little bit of a beard below the lips yes kind of the long kind of aqu- aquiline nose mm-hmm. um and it's, it's just it's more human oval shaped rather than right. kind of football shaped like stewie from family Guy. yes and it's idealized yes it's idealized and so he pulls this mask out and and kind of the idea is that schleeman is like, is like that's the face of a king right and again just like when he found the church of priam he um, he shuts down the dig, right? Says so that it's again, it's like going out with a bang. This is I found what I wanted to find, and now on to other things. And so he he ends on this really high note, where again, logically thinking, speaking, you would think, you know, why not look for more? If, the, if this is the kind of thing you're finding, keep and digging. If, and in fact, one of the Athenian archaeologists who was brought in after Schliemann discovered an additional shaft grave that Schliemann had overlooked. Oh, that's right. That's right. Exactly. So um, what's going on there? And so it's, it's trying to get into kind of that warped psychology of Schliemann. Hmm. And so Trail and others have pointed out that, um, and again, Schliemann often uses this language. I mean, it's soon after he uses the language that, you know, I, th- now that's the face that it matched my imagination of what Agamemnon should look like. Right. right? Why should that matter at all? Right. And so... So it's, it's fair to say, if I can just interrupt, that yeah. Trail, the author David Trail, Trail has gone cold on this, it has, you might it has, say. It has gone cold. In fact, uh, two times back in the early 80s, Trail petitioned the the Archaeological Museum in Athens to release the mask for a simple kind of chemical test, mm. which would show if it's... You know, 200 years old? or you know, That's thousands. what I was wondering. Right. So one of the theories is that Schliemann went off to Paris or to Athens? Yes, and had a, a, a mask made according to kind of his imagination. A counterfeit. Right? right, and we know that he had relationships with goldsmiths and, and the like, and that it's all that really kind of that foggy um, rumor about uh, kind of his shadiness. But Calder, I, I remember, I gave a presentation on this when I was in graduate school, and he made a big deal of you if you put a picture of um, the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm, next to the mask of Agamemnon, uh, you have this uncanny resemblance. Mm. Um, and so I've heard that he looks like Schliemann, actually. Oh, really? That, he, that Schliemann um, counterfeited the mask to look like himself. Like himself? That, I mean, that would be perfect. Right. right. Um, but kind of giving him kind of uh, central northern European features. Right. Um, Which the Greeks of that age, and Mycenaeans are Greeks, as yeah. we learned last time, would not have had. Would not have had, right? And so the kind of Schliemann's you know, idea of nobility that he grew up with that was kind of ingrained in him kind of spill out into his into this counterfeit, right? What about pomade? What about pomade? Why are you bringing right. pomade here? Well, because you mentioned something about the the mustache, the handlebar mustache yeah, on yeah, the mask like, of Agamemnon. It looks like Raleigh Fingers. You remember the old baseball pitcher? I do the, not, the, for the, sure. The waxed mustache. Okay. Or you know, the guy who's tying the damsel in distress to the train tracks. Right. You know, right? Um, yes, that's one of the striking things. Snidely about, Whiplash. That's that's the guy. That's right. Um, but one of the striking things about the Matthew Agamemnon, he's got that pointy handlebar hmm. mustache like Kaiser Wilhelm does. Right. And so Schliemann, he had to try to explain this somehow. And again, from his own diaries, he, he writes about the mask. You got a quote for I us? I do have a quote. He wrote uh, about the mask. In a perfect state of preservation, on the other hand, is the massive golden mask of the body at the south end of the tomb. Its features are altogether Hellenic. And I call particular attention to the long, thin nose running in a direct line with the forehead, which is but small. The eyes, which are shut, are large and well represented by the eyelids. Very characteristic is also the large mouth with its well-proportioned lips. The beard is also well represented, and particularly the mustache, whose extremities are turned upwards to a point in the form of crescents. This circumstance seems to leave no doubt that the ancient Mycenaeans used oil or some sort of pomatum, pomade, in dressing their hair. Both masks are of repoussé work. I don't know what that means. It's a French word that means fancy. Fancy? Okay. Um, and certainly nobody will uh, for a moment doubt that they were intended to represent portraits of the deceased whose faces they have covered for ages. We are amazed at the skill of the ancient Mycenaean goldsmiths who could model the portraits of men in massive gold plate 
and consequently do as much as any modern goldsmith would be able to perform. You know, That's for, really interesting. It is, right? Yeah, but, so uh, go ahead. But, uh, I mean, did the ancient Mycenaeans have, like, brill cream? It's certainly possible. Do you think it's possible? What did they not invent? <laughs> I true. ask you. That's true, yeah. Actually, repoussé. Yeah. Uh, it's where you take a piece of gold foil and you put it over a wooden form ah. and you pound it until it takes on the shape of the, the mold underneath. Okay. Could be the so, very thing that he instructed some goldsmith to do. You're right. If it's a forgery, yeah. right? If it's a forgery, then that's what he instructed them I mean, to do. He, he, I mean, if you have that in mind, it's almost like he's over-explaining here, mm -hmm. right? And the other interesting thing I found out about Trail, and the listener should know if, if they want to, that I was pretty much on Schliemann's side before I began reading the Trail book. Oh, you were? For the most part, yeah. I, I thought... Even the benefit of the doubt? I, yes, I did. Okay. I thought the criticisms against him were more modern. And since I have a strong antipathy to anything recent, <laughs> I, I didn't think that the criticisms were probably valid. Yeah. What started to push me in the other direction was that he was criticized at the time. Yes. He was criticized by contemporaries, by Greeks, by Germans, by people who knew him. And he was fairly dishonest in a lot of the ways that he recorded things. Right. There's no doubt about that. One interesting point was that he didn't mention this mask in his diary on the day that he later said it was discovered. That's right. That's so the, all kinds of issues with the timeline. Correct. Right. So That's, if you find something that you later think is so fantastic, why not put it in your diary? Right. So with the Troy finds, it was plausible to me that he omitted details because he didn't want to be discovered by the Turkish authorities. Right. Exactly. But at Mycenae, he has carte blanche for the most part. Right. So why is he... Uh, playing fast and loose with the timeline. Exactly. What does he What does he stand to gain? What it's is, It's pretty confusing. Yes. But as we get close to wrapping up here, Jeff, yep. maybe we can talk a little bit about how the mask has been received, its importance for Greek tourism, and one particularly interesting incident with uh, you and me and our lovely tour guide when we were in yes. Olympia. Yes, exactly. So um, I think we talked a little bit last episode, but uh, when you walk into the museum, the National Museum in, in Athens, and through the first door, it's this mask that's staring back at you. So it is, uh, in many ways, a kind of symbol of tourism. It is the icon of, it, of Greek tourism. It, exactly right. And maybe in the top ten of the most famous uh, art objects of all time. Yeah, exactly. And whatever you, what, you know, whatever Schliemann might have, may have may not have done. I mean, his discoveries at Marcini. I mean, it's up there with King Tut. Absolutely. Uh, Howard Carter in 1922. Definitely. Um, it's, it's, it's a massive discovery. And, and very important to the Greek economy. Yes. Which relies a, a tremendous amount on tourism. Right. So um, I mentioned David Trail wanting to get this mask tested, but the, um, uh, Greece has never released the mask. Right. That. right. Kind of like the Shroud of Turin. Yes. Which has been tested, but uh, portions of it. But they're very, very jealously guarding this object because uh, so much of their economy depends on people like you and I and our students coming to see it. Exactly right. And I have to imagine that even the controversy itself, well, I, my sense is not that it's not very well known. That in and of itself is it's a kind of the, you know, um, there's no such thing as bad press. Right. You know, people are coming to see the mask maybe because it's controversial. Right. Right. So um, people like you, Jeff, skeptics. Exactly right. So and, until that kind of test is made, there it sits in kind of this kind of this fog of is it or isn't it. So the year is 2011. It's January. Yes. We're at Olympia yeah. at the Hotel Antonius. Was that the one? Is that right? Yes. I think that's the one in Olympia. With, yes, with the, with the noisy elevator. That's right. <laughs> that elevator, which gives a, <laughs> a kind of ad nauseum sound. Exactly right. <laughs> to the entire establishment. Yeah. Scared me significantly. The first of, Jeff, what is that? <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. yeah. Someone's having serious indigestion <laughs> all throughout the hallway. <laughs> but it's in fact just the elevator shaft. It was, yes, yep. exactly. So we're in that uh, in that lobby. Hotels in Greece have fantastic lobbies. They spend all the money on the lobby. All the money is on marble and beautiful artistry on the walls, paintings and so forth. You get back to the room, it's a little Motel 5, exactly. probably. The elevator engineering. That's right. <laughs> the Broccoli Apollo. <laughs> exactly right. Tell right. us about Broccoli Apollo. Oh, um, that could be an episode. Of okay, itself, we'll leave right? that for we'll the future that for then. Later. But, but um, you're there in the lobby, yes. and you're giving your lecture on Schliemann and is the mask a fake? We're sitting before the fire. Yes. There are kind of uh, bearskin rugs on the floor exactly. to conjure up a kind of Court of Alexander, Court of Philip was, uh, the motif. The was great. It was great. Right. I want to say there was a kind of a fire burning behind me. And what happened? Well, I was giving this talk, uh, kind of a, really in some ways kind of a shortened version of this episode. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christiana, our guide, who's become now kind of a good friend to both of us. Lovely woman. Um, 
she, uh, I think to her great credit, she would, uh, she would attend our lectures. Right? Yes. She was always wanting to learn things. A serious student of Greek culture. Student, right. And I remember as I was giving this and talking about the possibility that the mask was fake and probably even kind of giving, giving my own bias. Right. That it is fake. I'm seeing her giving me the, She starts to say, the, ohi, 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 ohi. No, 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 no. Right. Uh, and to give me that, uh, that evil eye. Tip the head back and yes. look down her nose at you. Right. And so I'm seeing this and I'm getting kind of the flop sweat. You too. should be starting to get nervous. <laughs> She's not a woman to mess with. <laughs> no. And I remember, I'll never forget, she came up to me afterwards and she said, do you really believe that? And she was kind of horrified at this idea right. that, that someone gave me, it wasn't really about, so much about the mask itself, it was about kind of besmirching Schliemann. Right. And I, I realized later um, in talking to her and, and looking into it, um, Schliemann is still, a, a, he's, a, he's a hero. Yeah, absolutely. Students. Yes. Um, he, he settled there in his late life. Um, he built, built a fabulous house, house which yeah, the Iliu Mele throne, the, That's right. the big house of Troy. Yep. Right. Yep. Right next to the Syntagma Square. Yes. Today it's a numismatic museum. Right. I visit it every time I go to Athens. It's wonderful. It's a gorgeous building. And they have, uh, they have, they have nice little things about Schliemann's life. In absolutely. The Designed by a German architect, as it turns out, the most famous one in Athens. Uh, but he poured so much money into the Athenian economy. Yeah, exactly. In some ways, he kind of was the catalyst for you know Athens becoming a kind of a, a, a tourist wealthy town. Yeah, a world city. Um, protecting, preserving the monuments. Mm -hmm. and such. And so He even paid for, as I remember now from Trail, he paid for the demolition of one of the Turkish towers on the Acropolis. Is that right? Because uh, it was blocking the view of the Parthenon. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was a benefactor yes. to Athens. Right, and they remember him. They remember him very well. That's right. right? So that that I can see that I can see why these little these little things that um, don't speak well of him would irritate a Greek. So Christiana was upset. She was very she was upset. We came. I mean, we we came around water under the bridge. Right? So as we wrap it up here, yeah. Jeff, if we came down to it, and I put the question to you like this: yeah. Mask of Agamemnon, real or a forgery? What are you going to say? Um, man, do I, I have to say yes or you no? You have to, or you're not leaving the studio. Um, I. I'm going to, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it's a fake. Really? Yes, I do. In some ways, I think it's a better story if it's a fake and I just want the better story. If he, if he could pull that off and I think he could, I think that's unbelievable. Hmm. That's oceans 11 type of, of, right. uh, you know, uh, wool over the eyes. It's, it's great. And I'm going to say it's real. You're going to say it's real. I'm going to say it's real. Oh, okay. Well, stakes are too high. What we'll to settle up with arm wrestling, something like that. That would be good. Okay. All right, before we wrap it up here, we got to talk about his tomb Absolutely. In, in Athens. You and I visited together. I think we both together saw it for the first time. It was 2011. Yes. A beautiful sunny afternoon uh, in Athens. A Sunday afternoon, we walked down to the, the cemetery. The first cemetery of Athens was this yeah. massive cemetery. Called the, it's called the First Cemetery. That's the name of it. Exactly right. right. Yep. And inside, what do we have? Inside, well, you, you walk through kind of the, the Grand Gates, and the way I remember this, kind of this big hill up to the left. And um, almost like this kind of this, this hill of honor. And there's Schliemann's tomb. Mm. It, it presents itself as like a mini Parthenon or like one of yep. the treasuries at Delphi. Beautiful Doric temple. Yep. It's got a bust of Heine himself on the mm -hmm. front. And you have to walk up the hill and you can kind of walk around the crypt. To, uh, right. And such. I think believe he and Sophie are yep, both buried there. Both buried there. And there are, there's a frieze that wraps around the top of it. It's yes. an architectural element on all, on, on many Greek temples. Right. And it, it, it uh, it's, it's, it goes back and forth between scenes from the Iliad, it appears, and then scenes of Sophia and Heinrich um, excavating. excavating. And there's one where uh, Schliemann himself is, he seems to be in full recitation mode. He's, he's probably you know, reciting Homer and Sophie's just looking at him, um, yeah. him endearingly. A scene from London where he was feted and, and treated uh, sumptuously after these amazing finds. Yes. Very popular in London. The British love their classics. Exactly right. And... Um, I think some accounts have Schliemann kind of having designed this tomb himself, right. um, which is perfectly in keeping with his persona. There's uh, above the crypt door, there is a, a two-line hexameter, technically hexameter, the same um, a meter and language of Homer that, again, Schliemann is said to have uh, composed himself as his own epitaph. And it translates something uh, along the lines of, um, uh, it's the tomb speaking to you, which is a very kind of ancient thing to do. You know, oh, passerby, right? It says, I the tomb speaking, cover Heinrich Schliemann of great fame. You should imitate him because he undertook many labors on behalf of mortals. Hmm. Right. That's a wonderful it's, quote. It's a great line. A so great shall line. we take it out here? Let's take it out. All right. So we have our gustatory parting shot, and Please. I'm going to be reading this as a quote from Orson Welles. My doctor told me I had to stop throwing intimate dinners for four unless there are three other people. <laughs> I love it. Ad nauseum. Right. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.